We're starting our Easter series this year, and, it, and it's called Ain't No Grave. Ever heard that song? I won't sing it because I remember last week. Anyway, but there's a song that says, Ain't No Grave Gonna Hold This Body Down. Well, there's several things that we celebrate that Easter does for us. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about the things that, that are done with. We don't have to struggle with them because the grave and the cross, what they did for us. The first week today, we're going to be talking about sin. I know, super fun topic, but it's all about sin today. So uh, recently, my, uh, my mother-in-law and my, my father-in-law, they uh, were cleaning out a house, and they found these giant bins of Beanie Babies. Now, I know, crazy. Let me tell you about Beanie Babies, if you, if you haven't, if you don't know, and maybe you've forgotten. Beanie Baby, this craze, they started selling them in 1993. I was 12. They would create artificial scare, scarcity and retire certain ones or only make a very small number available so that these things became super popular, super wanted. They were all over the place. People went crazy. By 1998, five years later, Beanie Babies had more than one billion in annual sales. One billion with a B. Now, are people still crazy about Beanie Babies? They are. Let me just show you the top three selling things on eBay. Beanie Babies. This is number three. This is a 1996 Peace Bear. Anybody ever have this one? No? All you Beanie Baby people is like, I'm, I'm a Beanie Baby. <laughs> I'm not ripping on you. It's okay. 1996 Peace Bear. It's multicolored. It sold for, this is, these are sold comps, right? This sold for $15,000. Think of the eBay fees on that bad boy. Okay. That's number three. Number two, gobbles. Anybody have gobbles, the turkey? I think it was pretty cool, wasn't it? Sold for $18,000. And then this, I don't you can't see it, but right here below, and it said they, they paid it, they, they charged them for shipping too. <laughs> That's rude. You pay $18,000, I'll give you free shipping, okay? So gobbles for $18,000. And then you won't believe the last one. Why is the owl 1997 and 98? There's errors all over it. $122,000, and they gave him free shipping. <laughs> Thoughtful. These are, these are things that actually sold on eBay. They're, they're crazy. So here's the thing we got this bin, and I'm like, what are we going to do? I'm like, we don't really want these things. And then my kids are in there, and I say, you can keep two. There was probably 80, right? And they, 75, thank you. I made them count. <laughs> they're all they're in both of these bins. And, I made, I, I, and, we're, and, and they were just in there chucking them at each other. They're like, whoa! And it was like a bird until the bird flew, right? If it's a, you know, whatever. And then I'm sitting at the table and I'm thinking, oh, what if they're worth something? <laughs> oh, no. So then that was the worst thought I had of the night. Because then it sends me down this rabbit hole. And the websites that have Beanie Baby prices and, and the value of them, they're, they're, all, they're everywhere. And you never know what it's going to say. And so I get on this one website, and it's talking about the, the, 50, no, it was like tw the 20 rarest Beanie Babies. So I, got, I start going through, and I'm like, hey, did you see this one? Yeah. We had both. We, had, we didn't have the rainbow bear. We had the, we had the turkey. Yeah. Gobbles was in there. Uh, the owl, we had both of those, 97 and 98. We had a crab. We had, I would go through the list, and I would start, I'd say, did you have this one? Yeah, and so I had this giant pile of the rarest Beanie Babies worth thousands of dollars. And I'm like, this is crazy. We're rich. <laughs> and then I started reading the details of what made them specific. Like, it was this year, and the tag had to be like this, and I'm like, chuck it, no. No, that's sad. Well, there's still hope. I had 40 other Beanie Babies that were popular. I get to the second one, the third one, the fifth one, the tenth one. I get down, and then my pile is gone, and I kept zero. 
I dug deeper and into the world of misprints and stamps and names and dates, and, and there were zero valuable Beanie Babies in that lot. It was a false hope for me. I thought, man, we're rich. This is awesome. $122,000 for that, that crazy Beanie Baby. I'm like, I'm not selling it on eBay because I'm not paying the fees. <laughs> Marketplace and deal with all that. There's lots of hype and no hope, but here's the funny part. I go through the whole list, and little did I know, laying on the couch on her phone, on her phone, was another person with hope that was building. As my hope was going away, I'm like, there's another. There was another person in the house who was like, well, what about this one? And so as I would chuck it into the bin, this, this not exactly happened, but like I, w- I would get done with it, and then that person uh, would, would pick that up <laughs> and be like, well, this one's... It. Oh. And it was more false hope. As we head towards Easter and we begin to celebrate this risen king, I want us to remember something, that there is no false hope to be found in Jesus. We sang about, this is my Jesus, let me tell you about what he's done. And and Brad talked about, when is the last time you shared what Christ has done? Because that is how we are the light of the world. It's not by what we're going to go do, and we've done all these things, and we're going to go out, and, and all, it, it's what has God done for me, and then I get to shine and reflect what he's done, and there is no false hope in this Jesus that we share. He won't let us down. As we celebrate him, we come, and we celebrate Easter of a risen king who's coming back again. We sang about that. Any empty promise of what Jesus can do and the hope that he brings was crushed by an empty grave. The work of Jesus on the cross that we share about and we will share about over the next month or so is not some, just some fad. It's not some phase or story that we tell. It's real. It's real. It changes our lives. It can change your life if it hasn't done so already. We celebrated baptisms last week, and we will again come Easter, because what Jesus did on a cross and coming out of that grave, it destroys sin, it destroys our guilt, it destroys our fear, and it destroys death. Ephesians 2, 1 says, once you were dead, that's us, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. The commander of the powers in this unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of this, all of us used to live that way. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger. Just like everyone else. Then it says this, but God. Is so rich in mercy. And he loves us. So much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us all in future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. Has he shown you that grace and kindness? As shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Church, we all have a sin problem. We live in a sin-filled world with sin-filled people serving themselves and their interests without seemingly any care of the lives that they're messing up and the lives that they're, that they're uh, affecting. The lives that they're missing with sin leading their heart. Think back before you knew Jesus and before he changed you and all that you missed when you realized how much God had for you. All of the opportunities, all of the love, all of the care, all of the, the change that he wanted to bring in your heart, but yet you were, you were still full of sin. The Bible says that we've all sinned. It says that if we, if we claim that we haven't, that we're liars, we've all been there. We've all missed the mark. Not done what what we knew we should have done. We've all disobeyed what scripture says. There isn't a person in this building that that has never sinned. And if we're honest this morning, we've all had sins that we struggle with. Sins that, dare dare I say, that we're more comfortable with. 
Sins that God calls sin, but we have done some spiritual gymnastics in our hearts and our minds and have sanitized and then sanctified something that God said was not good for us. What sins are you comfortable with? Like, no one, Pastor Andy. Okay. What sins have you struggled with? No matter what our culture says, hear me, or social media says, or anything else, even some churches allow it, doesn't matter. God is the only one who gets to define what sin is. He's the only one that gets to define what missing the mark means for us. It's not me. It's not you. There are things that you can do that if I would do would be a sin for me, would be, uh, would be moving me away from Christ. There's things that, that, that you, know, you may have struggled with and you get so comfortable with and, and the enemy wants you to be like, it's okay, it's okay. Look at what they're doing. No, don't, we've never done that, right? I have this struggle in my life, but look how bad that, that person, Susie. I don't know why I keep saying Susie. Susie was on the back of the card. Susie's just a sinner. Man, can you believe what she did? Can you believe all that she's struggling with? Can you believe? And you know what? You're comfortable with gossip. James 4.17 says this. It says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. We have sins that we would never touch. So if I have to say, would you ever kill someone? No, I'd never, never do that. I would never cheat, never steal, never do those things. But what about the other ones that we like and are a little less damaging or are harder to get caught in? Oh, gossiping. What would define gossiping? It's just a prayer, it's a prayer request. <laughs> How about entertaining gossip? Would you say that even entertaining someone gossiping is a sin? Does it miss the mark for what God wants for your life? I believe it does. How about lying? It's just a little white light. It's not that big of a deal. How about coveting? Idol worship. You're like, I don't have any idols in my home. I guarantee you're carrying one in your pocketbook. If you even have a pocketbook or a purse, I guess. My wallet's down there. If, if your money is all you think about and all you work about and all you do about, is money your idol? Anything can be your idol if it, if it replaces God. So idol worship. How about hostility? Quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, except for when IU plays. <laughs> Lord, help me. Selfish ambition. I, I got to get to where I'm going. I want to be famous. I got to get, I want people to know who I am. Got to rise. I got I to be the boss. How about distinction or division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these? Friends, we all come together today with one thing in common. We've all missed the mark. For all have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3 tells us. When I was uh, in sports, we, we would usually warm up by racing, right? You, you just warm up, you run from one end to the other end. I knew at the get-go that I wasn't going to be first. I knew it. There's no question. But let me tell you something. I knew also that I wasn't going to be last. Because I was going to push and make sure that somebody else was the, the last one, the slow poke. It wasn't going to be me. Just my heart. Wrong, right, missed the mark, whatever it is. So here I am, this prideful person. And this person, I see I, I'm in the middle of the pack and I'm just looking behind me to see if that person is slower than me and how, much, how hard I got to go. But we, we don't do anything like that, right, in our, in our, our Christian life. We don't judge how, how, how much we're struggling with how much others are struggling. We're not, oh, well, at least I'm not as slow as that person. Well, God broke, literally broke this away from my heart and my mind. Uh, uh, several years ago, Sarah and I decided to run a 5K. And um, just not runners. And um, we get to the point where we're being passed at the beginning, which I expected, right? And then people with strollers start passing us. <sighs> now see <laughs> I had covenanted with my wife I said we're going to do this together so no matter how hard you go I'll wait for you 
And he, he literally broke, <laughs> he broke this away from my heart because I get, we get near the end and we are the last two. This is our first 5K we've ever done. We were really proud of ourselves when we got done. But we get to the line, we realize we're the last two, and I'm like, you go ahead. And I was going to be last. Because I knew in my heart that it was a prideful thing, and I didn't want her to be last. And I remembered in marriage somewhere along the line, they said, if you always have to be the winner, then your, your spouse is the, always the loser. And for some reason, God brought that to my heart. And I thought, ah, oh, okay. It's not about me being last. It's about me being kind. It's not about my, me, me saying, well, I struggle with this sin, and that person over there struggling with that sin. They're much worse than me, so look at me. No, it's about where our hearts are at. The purpose of Easter and all the work that Jesus did isn't just that we aren't last. This morning, the empty grave means that even though we've sinned, that sin does not hold power over us, and we can live victorious lives. Do you believe that this morning? 1 John 3 says this, starting with verse 4, Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God, and you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Then verse 6, anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy, destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. Because God's life is in them. So they can, can't keep on sinning because they're children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. Yes, we've all sinned, but I'm sharing good news this morning that Jesus died for our sins. But that's not it. There's more. It didn't just stop at forgiveness of wrongs that have been done. It didn't just give you a get out of hell free card. Because let's be honest, some people, they come to God for that. They're like, God, I don't want to go to hell. So here I am. I hope, I hope I've done enough just to, to, just to get to the beat, not to be the last person in heaven. Not to be the, the person that, that struggled all the way through. I'm just going to just struggle and, and, and fight. But I, I'm going to, no, there is more. There is more. It isn't just fire insurance. And you just keep coming back every Sunday and you pay the premium. <laughs> there is a, hear me this morning. There is a freedom that can come from sin. That you can be free from sin and the power that it holds over each and every one of us. No matter what the sin is. No matter how long you've been struggling with it. God can free you from the power of that sin. His word says it, and I believe it. Do you? God sending Jesus was the remedy for anything that can ail our hearts and make us miss the mark and sin and separate us from God. This morning, an empty grave empties sin of its power over us. Romans 5, starting in verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. It includes us. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time Adam, from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol. Some of this is going to get in the weeds, but follow me with me. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who is yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Have you found that grace and that gift in Jesus Christ today? That power over sin. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to, led to condemnation. But God's free gift leads 
to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. And here that phrase is again, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph. That's us. That's you. That's me. For those that receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Have you been made new? Are you being made new? This morning, victory is yours if you'll take it. You ask, he says, for all who receive it will, what will triumph over sin through Christ? Tell me what sin you're struggling with that, that Jesus didn't die for. Tell me how, how much you've sinned. Tell me the struggle that you've had, the, the lives that you've messed up, yours included, that God can't redeem. Tell me what sin that you're holding on to that Jesus can't forgive you of. You're like, but, but Andy, you don't know, man. You don't know how deep this goes. I don't. You're right, but God does. Because his word says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so while you're still a sinner, Christ's love, his grace and mercy are pulling you to him because he wants you to find forgiveness in, in this life right now. Tell me what sin that you've committed that Jesus wouldn't bring grace to and call you to go and sin no more. I think often about the, the woman that was caught in adultery and they brought her to Jesus and his response. I hope that's our response as a church. When people struggle with sin and they, they come and we're like, I've, I've, I've messed up, I've missed the mark. Because that's the body of Christ. Are we responding the way Christ would respond? Tell me what sin that you, sin have you become so comfortable with that God can't help you break the habit of. You're like, but I'm, I, I don't know. I just have this habit. I go through this phase and this cycle, and then I struggle with this, and I struggle with that, and then that happens. And I can see it happening. Tell me what God can't do. But this can only happen, his changing your life. We can only live in this power if our hearts belong to God. This can only continue to happen if we allow his spirit to teach us through prayer and through the word and fellowship and remind us of what we need to be reminded of. Hear me this morning. I'm not your judge. I'm not your jury. So my opinion of what you're struggling with means very little. I've sat through messages that have preached against sin and it's almost always included a list. You've been there? Of places you can't go, activities you can't do, stuff you can't say, stuff you can't buy, stuff you can't... And things, my goodness, the things that I've been told. Well, I'm sorry this morning, there is no list on the back of your bulletin of sins. You won't get that list from me because I believe that if we are being filled up with godly things, that the Holy Spirit will speak to us when we step outside of those things. I believe that. Spirit-led. Are we being spirit-led? Too often the church universal has burdened believers with a guilty or with a weighty spiritual life, heavy with do's and don'ts to be our markers of how much we love God and how holy we are. Because yes, our obedience, it just says, you will see, your righteousness will be your, your, your calling card. It will be what we see when God has changed you. Absolutely. But here's the thing. We must get to a point where we are daily and weekly and monthly at different times and in different ways coming to God for a spiritual alignment of our hearts, a spiritual alignment of our minds and our soul and our strength and allowing those things to be our marker, allowing what sin, what, what scripture says is a sin to be sin. For, for, and it has to happen from the inside out, real heart change. Because we're all going to face bumps and weather and wear and new seasons 
and tough situations that can and will, if we leave them unchecked, lead into sinful thoughts, actions, and behaviors. When's the last time you did a checkup? We must be keeping in step with the Spirit so that when we do need alignment, it is taken care of before the spiritual wheels come off. Spiritual check-ins need to be a daily thing. They need to be a weekly thing. We don't come here just for entertainment. We don't come here just to hear the songs or to hear the message or to, to see a friend or to sit in a pew because that's where we always sit and that's what we do on a Sunday. We should be constantly coming to God and, and, being, and checking in with him. Two passages come to mind. <laughs> the first one is Hebrews. Starting in verse 12 and verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a, a huge crowd of witness to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. What's slowing you down today? What's slowing you down? And then it says, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us what is holding you back what is holding you down are you in a season this morning of struggle and possible sin that is separating you from God if so will you allow God to break that power over your life and if not why not Why, would, why do you want to choose to live under the weight of that sin, under the restrictions of that struggle, under the anxiety and the guilt and the fear that that, that would bring? It isn't good for you. And it's missing the mark. Recently, um, Um, there was a study, I'll, I'll start there, a study that was found that, that losing one pound of weight, if you lose one pound, results in four pounds of pressure being removed from one knee. So you lose, let's do math here, you ready? You lose 10 pounds, that's, that's how many? 40 pounds. You lose 20 pounds. Yeah, we're getting mad, you didn't know you were going to have a math quiz. 10 pounds would relieve 40 pressures off of your knee. Now, I know we like to have knee replacements here. <laughs> but can you imagine, can you imagine what when you lose 40, 50, 60 pounds, the pressure that is taken off the knees? I've lost some weight recently. I played basketball, and I, I, it's, it's, a, it's crazy how my knees have changed afterwards. The pain that used to be in there. I'll be like, Monday, Monday night, get home, get in a hot tub. I get the the bin get the whatever the aspirin cream whatever whatever put it on the knee. I'm like oh my knee. Tuesday I'm coming in I'm wobbling. Kim's like played basketball last night and I'm like yep. <laughs> and then Wednesday it's like uh, getting out of bed. It's like it's, it's, and and it changed. Now there's other things that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but can I tell you something? Yes, one pound, four pounds. So ten, you lose ten pounds. That's forty pounds of pressure. Can I, can I say that we don't need a study for this next thing I'm getting ready to say because I've seen it happen time and time again. When we give God our sin and let him forgive us and take that from us, the spiritual pressure that comes off of us is immense. And this morning, I think the enemy, when we have so many things that we're struggling with, so many things where we're just missing the mark, we get pushed down. And he doesn't want you to even think that there's a freedom to be found. He's like, what is, what is freedom? What even is that? I don't even know that word. The same is true spiritually when we throw off spiritual weight that, and the sin that holds us down and trips us up. This morning, as we're moving towards Easter, we are celebrating a life that isn't defined by sin. We're celebrating an empty tomb that empties sin of its power over us. We can lead victorious lives through the power of God's spirit living in us. A life that is different, that is set apart, 
from those around us. A life that is contrary to the follow your heart culture. A life that is different and instead we, we lead our hearts straight to God. When we mess up, we don't run and hide in the darkness. We don't cower in shame. We don't cover it up with more sin. No, we go to the Father. I love, love, love how, how Pastor Rick has shared over the years that, that, that we just need to be allowing God to help us sin less and less and less. It's a process. Nobody in here is perfect. We're not going to just one day be a boom. Sainthood. But where are our hearts bent towards? Are our hearts bent to this struggle and we're like, it's just it's my struggle. I just deal with it. We look around and, and spiritually speaking, we look around. Somebody comes in our spiritual house and they start poking around and be like, what's going on here? Is that us today? Here's the thing. I love what, uh, Psalm 51. It shares that when, when David was caught in, in his season of sin, he doesn't run after he already sinned and then sinned again and then sinned some more with Bathsheba. It's, 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 a, it's a crazy thing, and I think the enemy likes to trick us and say, well, you got to do more sin to cover that sin up. you got to lie, then you got to do this, and, and then maybe you should gossip a little bit more so the focus is over here. He says this, Psalm 51.10. Create in me a clean heart. <sighs> Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a, a loyal spirit, a right spirit within me. He goes on to say, Cast me not, cast not your spirit, like take your spirit away from me, but create in me a clean heart. I don't know about you, but I have to pray that quite a bit. Created me a clean heart. God, I messed up. Renew a right spirit within me. What we celebrate this Easter isn't just a story. It isn't just some hype that we've created and we keep playing up about a man who lived over 2,000 years ago. It isn't a fad. It's not even a religion. It's a relationship. We don't try to control people. We try to point them to Christ. And let his spirit help us to stay in step. There is no empty promises of hope. There are no tricks and tips and self-help guides on how to get over sin in your life. <clears throat> Through the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, who emptied the tomb and now empties the power of sin over our lives, I believe that you and I can live victorious lives over sin. Amen. What do we do? We repent. It's not a word we, we use much. We walk away from things or people or activities or attitudes that lead you away from God. So that's, that's my first question this morning. Do you have things in your life that you need to walk away from? You're like, I wouldn't call that sin, but anything that, that separates you from God, anything that helps you miss the mark, anything that you know that is good, you should do it. Are there things in your life people, activities, attitudes that are leading you away from God. When we pray and ask God to forgive us of our sins, his word says that he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin. What a promise that is today. We repent and then we follow God and then we stay in step with his spirit. What we read from earlier says, but even greater in Romans 5, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. There is freedom from sin. And it's found in Jesus. It's found in Jesus today. It'll be found in Jesus tomorrow and the next. And this is a freedom that lasts because we believe that who the Son sets free is free indeed. 